But one thing you got to do, and uh, I hope that everybody is really paying attention, is put your pride to the side. Because that pride is stopping a lot of us from getting to where we need to be. A lot of people is too cool in order to get things done. A lot of y'all is too cool. You're too gangster. You're too street to get anything done. And then 20 years from now, you're going to be sitting there like, damn, I should have said something. Yo, what's good? This is Jay Damage, the biggest designer from the South Bend. And right now you're watching What's Your Hustle podcast. What's your hustle? What do you do? Here to bring money and attention to you. A lot of people want to know you got to give them the truth. Here to run the numbers up. We about to go through the roof. What's your hustle? What's your hustle? Here to talk about your grind. How you spend your time. We done brought you to the show. You got to speak what's on your mind. What's your hustle? What's your hustle? What's your hustle? What's your hustle? Yeah, yeah. All right, so appreciate you coming to the podcast. Before we jump into this, Jay, let everybody know where they can find you at. Well, you can go to my main website, which is jdamage.com. Uh, you know, on my website, you can find uh, basically uh, mostly everything I do. Uh, if you want to find any immediate things I do, go to my Instagram. Uh, just search up jdamage designs, or uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, just search jdamage, and uh, or shit, if you're looking for anything that I'm doing, just search, uh, just Google jdamage, J A Y D A M A G E, and you can basically find all my different handles. Cause I have a lot of websites. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, who who was who was Jay Damage before you was Jay Damage? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, first off, um, you know when I first because this all started from uh, me being a gospel rapper. You know what I'm saying? It, when I was 14, I used to be a gospel. I was a local gospel rapper. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It was I was in a group. It was uh, me and my friend Leonard, which. Uh, our group name was J and L B. So yeah. we used to go around to like different churches, you know, doing our little performances and whatnot. And that was like my first like skin in the game far as like being a performer, uh rapping at actually at a uh, studio. We was like this is back then before like it was any like real guitar center studios that people had at their crib. You know, we was either going to real deal high end studios or, you know, uh I guess makeshift studios that people made at their cribs. Like, and that was like the very beginning of the whole Jay Damage thing. But at first, my name was just Jay. Because like everybody who knows me, they just know me as Jay. So like uh, after that, like the whole Damage thing, that actually came from me, you know, just, you know, doing regular raps. Like uh, I was trying to get out of the whole mode of being um, basically just this sidekick rapper for the J and L B thing when I was a kid. So by the time I, you know, I got a little bit older, I ended up switching it to Jay Damage. Yeah. And so you was so you just doing gospel rap, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you do you you was doing video production and then also graphic graphic video design. production came way after, way after, so, way after. So yeah. okay, so what happened after the after doing gospel rap? Then so so gospel rap that like I said, I did that in my teenage years. So that only lasted what like two years. So I did that till I was a, probably like sixteen. Around 16, 17, around 16, 17, I ended up, uh, you know, I was in a lot of trouble at that time. And, um, you know, I, I had got arrested. You know, it was a crazy party we went to, got shot up. You know, my mom was like, you know, I was doing too much in the streets, pretty much. So my mom ended up uh, sending me to Chicago Job Corps. So I moved to Chicago for probably like, um, i say about three, four years. So I moved to Chicago all the way until I was 20. I would say 1920s until I was 1920 is when I ended up coming back to uh, Indiana. And so that whole time where I was in Chicago, that's kind of how I transitioned into doing, you know, regular rap. And uh, man, the beautiful thing about living in Chicago is when I was living in Chicago, that's when I really got to experience that I wasn't really as good as I thought I was. Right. You know, a lot of people, they don't understand that, you know, when you dealing with your own local square or you dealing with your own crew of people you know everybody around you they love you you know what i'm saying they're gonna show you love no matter what you put out but once i moved to chicago that's when i started realizing that what we was doing wasn't even that good and chicago like for real like like once i got to chicago i got to see 
how you actually really rap. Like how you, I went to a real, I went to Chicago. They took me to a real studio. Like they took me to like some high end. This dude had like a house on the South side in the hood. And he had like a dope ass studio, like in his crib. I'm talking about like high end shit everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to that studio, I was scared as hell. And that's when I found out like, okay, I wasn't doing this shit. I, I thought I was really doing this shit, but this is how you really do this shit. When I went to that real studio, that showed me like, okay, I need to take this shit to another level and I need to like really start taking this shit serious. And that's what, how I started exploring into doing other things, not only from rap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what made you what made you quit the rap then and um and move to other stuff? So once I got from the Chicago, so uh I graduated from uh Job Corps, went to Malcolm X College for a little bit. I ended up moving back to South Bend. By the time I was fully back in South Bend, I was uh, 20 years old. By the time I was fully back in South Bend, um, I rapped probably till like 2012. 2012 was, um, you know, is when I really stopped the whole rapping thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, Cause a little bit after that, you know, I did my rapping thing. We shot a couple music videos with a, a director named Ryan Blasky. And uh, after we shot those music videos with him, um, a, you know, a little afterwards, my uh, my, you know, my, one of my rap homies that was rapping with me, my guy, Ali G, which is my best friend, he ended up dying. So um, once he ended up dying, that's when I was, uh, you know, we started exploring other things. You know, it was right before he started dying. You know, um, I want to say that tax time. Like, it was weird because uh, Ryan Blasky, like basically we couldn't afford this dude so basically he didn't want to fuck with us no more <laughs> like so uh <laughs> for real that is what it is one day you know uh he was he wasn't even charged us that much money i think he was only charged us like 200 or some shit like that but you know we were still young niggas we didn't really have money like that we was from coming straight out the streets so like uh he stopped fucking with us but i'm actually glad he stopped fucking with us because that's actually what lean me to start doing other things because i'm like okay if we can't afford this dude we can figure this shit out on our own and that's when that tax time came me and my guy ali g we went out and used our tax money to go buy you know the, the canon cameras we bought the canon t3 and the canon t3i and that was like my first journey into doing something outside of rap music you mentioned ryan blasky so from entrepreneur to like entrepreneur like how does it feel to like see the progression in him you know oh yeah, saying? like uh, I'm gonna keep it 100 percent honest with you. I've been watching none of his new stuff, so I wouldn't, I can't really necessarily say that I'm proud of his progress. But uh, some years ago, uh, I tapped in with like something he was doing, and I was like, wow, like you know, I mean, because this was like last time I checked up on his stuff was like 2017, 2018, and he had like some super high end stuff going on. So yeah, I already knew he was gonna progress because he was dope. He was like literally one of the best videographers i had seen at that time this was 2012 2012 all he had was a camera and it looked like he was shooting a movie mm -hmm. so like uh he i feel like he was already mentally skilled in video production on a whole different level that a lot of people didn't even see so like i, I wouldn't be surprised if he was shooting a, a disney film or something at this point right. yeah we was uh we was in school together i wasn't um we wasn't in the same we wasn't in like the same class but um, directly, but we had like the same teacher. And so like when they would show examples of work, they would always show stuff that he had produced. And mm -hmm. even when we was in school, he was already winning like um, um, some awards and stuff. So at that time I had, mm -hmm. I had looked up to him, you know. So I, did, I didn't know him. I didn't know anything about any of that. The way I met this man was he came to me. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people don't know that uh, I already kind of had like a tiny little buzz in South Bend. So one day he reached out to me and was telling me he shoot music videos. That's basically how we linked up. You know what I'm saying? And we kind of did it from there. But I'm actually, you know, I haven't spoke to the man in years, but uh, I'm actually proud of uh, what he's doing. And I and I thank him because if he would have never uh, came to us and uh, bust out of nowhere and stopped dealing with us, then I wouldn't ever, you know, start exploring videography. So I, I definitely thank him for that, even though, you know, he ran out on us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was funny, <laughs> even though he ran out on us. <laughs> he did. I mean, it is what it is. Hey, some, yo, you know, some, yo, sometimes, you know, 
in in business when you start when you start in the beginning right it's cool that you deal with like certain individuals it is what it is you know you mm -hmm. as my mentor would say you taking that low hanging fruit but as you start to grow and you start to get more business sense you start reading more books you get mentors and listening to podcasts and different things and you start realizing that okay it's a certain way that i have to start going about you know doing business and you start figuring out what they call your ideal client and at exactly. that time you know, and at the level he was at, you may have not been his ideal client, you know what I'm saying, anymore. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, it's not like personal or anything. Uh, sometimes it's just solely based upon just, you know, making the best decision for your um, business. And, and, I, and yeah, let me let me clear that up real quick. Uh, I don't think he had anything personal with me or anything like that. I, I don't think that he hated me or he had some issue with me. I just think that, you know, he probably just wanted to go out and spread his wings. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, and uh, I kind of, and the older I become, I kind of understand why he did that because I've had to do that. Like, like I, t like I tell people all the time, I started in a group and, you know, eventually I wasn't able to spread my wings until I kind of start moving on my own. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Once you start moving on, the, the person that's going to love you the best is you. Like in the, and sometimes ain't nobody going to work as hard as you. Sometimes you got to keep moving no matter what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, it took a lot for me to get to the point that I'm at. I lost a lot of people on this journey. And I want anybody that's watching this to understand that uh, if you plan on getting far in this entrepreneurship, you might lose some people. Like literally, physically or mentally, you, you're going to lose some people on this path. And uh, the best thing I would say to do is be prepared and keep working. Yeah. Um, what's the best part of um, being an entrepreneur to you? I think the best part is um, having my independence and not having to um, work a regular job. I mean, me personally, I actually liked working a regular job. You know, I used to be a, a, a trash man at the hospital and I actually liked my job. <laughs> my job was cool. My job was very low key. All I had to do was walk to the rooms and grab trash out of these rooms. I'd never seen anybody, never had to deal with anybody, didn't have no supervisor breathing down my neck. Working a job was cool, but I kind of like the freedom of my entrepreneurship because I can wake up and I'm doing something that I really like to do. See, I feel like in life, like, you know, you just have to find something that you really just like to do. And a lot of people don't really know what they like. I, I've asked a lot of people in my lifetime, like, you know, find what you like to do and then just hone in on that and just focus on doing that and find a way to do that independently. But people never chase that. But I, I was like, look, I like to draw. You know, I like to, um, you know, I've been drawing literally since I was a kid. I like to draw and I like to explore other things within drawing. And I was like, I would do this for free. <laughs> like wow. people don't know I did graphic design for free for the first three years until people actually start paying me. So find that thing that you love to do and just do it. And that's what I like about my entrepreneurship. I just love to be independent. I love to wake up and do what I do, do what I do every single day. <laughs> so let's go back to when you made, so you was, you, okay. So let's go back. You was doing music. You was mm -hmm. a, you back in your 10 years, you was a gospel rap artist. Mm -hmm. And then you start transitioning from regular, from regular rap to regular rap and then, and then to videography and to, to videography and then so um why did you stop why did you stop videography one because the only mm -hmm. reason why i say because your stuff was the stuff was dope so mm -hmm. um i and, still do it by the way yeah okay yeah yeah yeah. yeah. You, you still do it but you do mm -hmm. like select projects now right? yes i'm just very selective with the projects yeah, yeah so um so you so basically yo primary source or, or your main stream of income is your graphic design. It's graphic design, yeah. It's your graphic design. Mm -hmm. So what was your feet first piece of no not not no I'm not I'm I just I just want to go back to once you made that decision you to say like okay you because you said yo you just gotta find out what you like. You say okay I like drawing. Okay you made a decision you say I like drawing so I'm gonna start mm -hmm. doing graphic design work. How did you how did you figure okay. out a way to mon how did you monetize that? How did okay. you so, do that? So this is how it happened. So I was doing videography. So uh once I got into the videography, and this is the weird thing about videography, I never was trying to be a videographer. I I've told people this a thousand times. Most people who know me, they know this. So um, you know, like I said, I, we stopped dealing with Ryan Blasky. Uh my friend Ali G ended up dying. So I ended up doing the videography thing on my own. I was I was only doing this for my friends. 
that was only for us, me, me and my friends, to basically blow ourselves up from rapping, right? right. So um, I had shot for like a couple, uh, you know, homies that I knew in the neighborhood. So then when I start doing it, all of a sudden, like I just start getting contacted from people. You know, uh, I had a, a a rapper I was uh, working with at the time named uh, his name was Stunner actually, but he gave his life to God now. His name is Benjamin Broadway now. So uh, what I was doing, I was uh, I was shooting. Um, uh, you know, videos for him, and I was shooting interviews at this time. So, um, uh, what he started doing, he reached out to some people he know, and he was like, "Yo, I can get you to shoot some uh, music videos for some people." And I was like, "Okay, cool." So he reached out to some people, and uh, one of the people that I did a, a, a interview for was a, a group at the time called Black Mob. So it was a uh, you know this dude Rex Rogan and his whole crew, and within his crew was a dude named Boss Bud. So I ended up shooting a music video for Boss Bud. And that's really how the whole graphic design thing came in. So when I shot this music video for Boss Bud, he was like, um, he was like, uh, hey, um, you know, do you also uh, do covers? Which I knew how to do mixtape covers because one of my closest homies is a graphic designer, but I didn't know how to like really do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when he asked me, I was like, yeah, but I was like, uh, shit, I was like, you know, I'm just charging $40 to do it. You know what I'm saying? And so he was like, okay, cool. He just gave me the $40. And I ain't gonna lie, I almost feel like I was stealing from him because I was like, I really don't know how to do this shit like that. But I was like, shit, I'm gonna go to the crib and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I went to the crib, you know, went to YouTube. I sat down, literally, I worked on his cover as I'm watching the tutorial. And that's literally how I figured out the whole graphic design thing. I, I literally watched like 10 tutorials that day, literally working on his cover. So then I put his cover together and then I sent it to him and then he was like, yeah, this is dope. This is cool. Shoot, let me get another one. And I was like, shit, you sure? <laughs> I was like, all right, bet. <laughs> shit, I'll go home and do another one. So I got another $40 from him. And then uh, after I think the second time he paid me for that, that's when I went home and I really took out the time to start figuring it out. Like I really took out the time to start figuring out how to put these covers together, get the titles together, edit in the pictures. And that's basically how I figured out how to do graphic design. Because I was like, I already know how to draw and put together designs, but I didn't know how to do this whole digital Photoshop program thing. So that's how I went online and figured out how to do that. And once I figured that out, that led me into graphic design. And I didn't get paid, I would say, for those first two years of after working with him. I didn't really, because I would say when I first started working with him, that was around like 2013, 14. I didn't really start getting paid until like 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, how did you, how did you keep it going? So you did this first, mm -hmm. you, did, you did your first two mixtape covers and then, then what happened? Yeah. So, this, so man, this is a crazy thing. So I was noticing after I did the covers for him, I was like, getting, he was got getting a bunch of likes and stuff just from posting them, like just from posting, you know, cause I had like a formula that I put together. I was like, I'm gonna shoot a music video and then I'm gonna do a cover for the music video. So these are like two different ways to promote it. So I'll go ahead and put out a preview for the music video and I'll also put out a cover, like like a preview cover, like a coming soon to promote the um, music video. And when I start doing that formula, it started getting a lot of people on board to basically sharing it or whatever. And it actually took a while for people to actually start buying covers because people were still just buying music videos. People was buying music videos. I was adding covers into that and that was slowly tr uh, you know, transferring me over into doing graphic design instead of just fully video. And that's basically how I transitioned into that. It was like both video and graphic design. And then slowly the video started coming out and the graphic design just started going up. Yeah. So what's some of the um, what's some of the, the tools and different things that you had to put in place to like really start to take like your business to the next level? So um, when I first started doing it, I mind you, all I had was a little Canon uh, T3 and uh, I had a, a, a MacBook that I got from Full Sail College. So basically, um, what, you know, the stuff I was doing, I basically, you know, had these programs that I got from free from some dude off the internet or whatever. And I basically was doing everything on like a low end circuit. But the way that I took everything to the next level, I started actually going out and buying all the equipment I needed. So for music videos, I, you know, I started figuring out like, what are the things that I need to make my stuff look more professional? So, you know, when I used to shoot music videos, as most of us videographers used to do, I just used to run around with the camera. Like, you know, I wasn't doing nothing special. Wasn't no special lenses. It was literally a Canon T3 and an 18 by 55 millimeter lens. 
And that was all I needed at the time. Mm -hmm. But then I needed my music videos to be more stable, more professional. So then I went out and I started figuring out how to get in stabilizers, how to get in certain, certain lighting setups for these certain environments, you know, figuring out locations, figuring out how to book these certain locations through these certain companies. Like it was just a, it's a lot of processes that you have to learn in order to make the, th the production bigger and whatever you're doing. That was what I started doing as far as the videography. As far as the graphic design, I had to get you know more high-end computers. I had to get hard drives. I had to go to um, stock image websites. You know, I had to just basically uh, figure out like different avenues and lanes to make everything more professional. I would say if anybody wants to take take everything to the next level that you're doing, first thing you want to do is start rebranding. Start rebranding everything and start researching and seeing whatever you're doing, what can you do to take that to the next level? Like, you know, what equipment you need to buy, you know, if everything is based on your image, what can you buy to make your image look better? Like, you know? So you saying that if, if you don't have the, the all of the professional tools and, and if, if you don't look a, look the certain part, then you won't get that, that business relationship or that bag you're trying to get? Well, well, cause look, this is, this is what I want people to understand is your look is everything. Like, you, you know, you have to understand that, you know, you could run around here with a cheap camera. I mean, not, not even cheap, like expensive camera and go ahead and shoot everybody's stuff. But the only way that people are going to shop with you, you have to have that high end professional presentation. I don't care who you is. Like, you know, if people don't see that high end professional presentation, the way that you, you know, maybe shooting videos or you may be putting out your designs, if people are not seeing that organized professional presentation, you only limited to a certain amount of money within your profession. That's just the reality. I mean, you know, people can come up to you and tell you, all you need to do is this. Go ahead, get you a camera and run out there and shoot some videos and people will just start liking you. But that's not the reality. Like, you know, I mean, that's the reality if you starting off and you're just trying to, you know, bag some customers or whatever. But if you're really trying to get this real high-end bag, oh, you got to upgrade. You got to upgrade and rebrand everything. You have to have that presentation that when a person sees you, you already look like you on. So, That's the way that you get high end negotiations. You get high end negotiations looking like you already got it. Because number one, you can't go up to a person and expect them to give you a lot when you really need it. Because when you really need it, that's when it's hard for you to negotiate. But if you don't need, but if they look at you and feel like you don't even need it like that, then it's, it's crazy because it's like they feel like they have to give you more. You're a graphic designer. I run my own video production company. That's one of my businesses. Mm -hmm. So. And we're dealing with, with people, a lot of times they like to just do stuff by just getting by. They don't want to, they, they send you bad quality photos, videos with like bad audio. They don't really see the importance. Like, mm -hmm. um, how do you go about educating, you know, some of your clients that may come your way on like, man, you, you know, you got to get better photos. You got to do this to like enhance your brand if you're trying to mm -hmm. look a certain part. Well, let me say this first. It's not my business to teach you business. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like when people come to me, a lot of times, you know, me, just me being a good person, I, I give them advice and I tell them certain things like that. But at the same time, it's not my business to tell you business. Like, you know, you should already kind of have your ducks in a row before you even get to the point of even approaching, you know, videographers, vid uh, you know, uh, graphic designers or anything of that nature. See, a lot of times like, uh, Hold on, what was the question again? I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the question was, like, how do you go about, like, <clears throat> edu how do you go about educating Oh, ed like educating ed people. Clients. Well, yeah, well, my thing is, uh, is just me being a, a, a good person, I, you know, I tell people, like, sometimes if a person comes to me with a low-quality photo, I, t I just tell them straight up. I'll be like, look, uh, this photo you sent me, me being a graphic designer as good as I am, I can work with this photo and I can try to put something together for you, but I can't guarantee you that people would take your project serious if they see this low quality picture. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like if somebody comes to me about a music video, they're like, look, I, like uh, a lot of times they call these, you know, guerrilla shooting or the, these hood music videos. They'd be like, oh, uh, just pull up on me on the block and we just going to shoot right here in front of the park. I always try to tell people like, you know, that's cool. We can go ahead and put something together because me being good at what I do, I can put something together for you. But I always recommend somebody, yo, if you want your stuff to look good and you want people to take you serious, like, yo, your stuff has to look a certain type of way that goes back into, you know, having that professional presentation. You know, uh, even if you a hood dude, it doesn't matter what you have. Like what you want to do is find you a, a photographer, get you some high quality pictures before you get any type of mixtape cover, or anything done. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, or uh, if you 
if you want to get a music video shot, make sure you set up some locations. Make sure you book you some models. Make sure if uh, you have a storyline, make sure, you know, uh, whatever locations that you use and make sure you require the videographer to have certain cameras, certain lights. And the very first thing you need to do before you contact anybody is make sure you have a decent budget put together. Don't go to these people with crumbs and expect them to give you diamonds. Right. Yeah. Y'all heard it from Jake Damage. How y'all stuff together for y'all pick up that phone, hitting DMs. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not going to lie to y'all. Like, when you come to a videographer, I know this because I got hella videographer friends. Is when you come to a videographer and you don't have that much money and you come to them basically trying to get a Hollywood production, they laughing at you. Like they like they're not even taking what you're saying serious. And then when they shoot the when they shoot your music video, they're not even putting their maximum hard effort into what they're doing. So take that serious what I'm saying. Wow. You out here just exposing people, bro. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um all right. I just want to make sure I'm 100% transparent with people because I feel like uh, in local areas like South Bend, I feel like a lot of us get the runaround. Like, you know, I know what it feels like to be that local rapper. Like, for real, I know what it feels like to be that dude that nobody is really checking for. And I try to tell people, like, uh, I'm not telling you that you're going to become famous, all this stuff I'm saying. But if you want people to take you serious, if you want to start making money from making music or... You know, you want to make sure your your presentation, your production is on point, straight up. That's the best thing I can tell you in order to get yourself to that next level. How do you manage a project? So a client hits you up and they say, hey, J Damage, I want you to do an album cover, mixtape cover. Mm -hmm. And they have like, this is how I want it designed. Or they have a basic idea. What's, what's, that, what's that process to deliverable to them? Okay, now, if you are a new graphic designer and you first start now, what you want to do is basically, um, it really depends on how you're conversating with the client. So there's two different type of clients. There's the client that will talk to you straight through text or, you know, on the internet through DM, inbox, or that's that client that you talk to on the phone. Two completely different processes. So I would say my advice to a graph, if you just starting out at graphic design, what you want to do is have you a list ready. So when a person contacts you to get a mixtape cover done, what you want to do is uh, send, basically send them a list or a form to fill out. Basically have them fill out their artist name, the name of the project, uh, every, uh, have them fill out a description of how they want that project to look as far as, you know, the colors, the titles, the texture, uh, you know, how they want their picture to be angled. And also ask them what type of files that they may need once the project is done. Ask them if they need a certain type of file like a PSD, PDF for once the project is done. And then um, uh, once you finally uh, export the project, ask them if they need the project within a certain size. Because once they start putting it on certain uh, uh, formats, like uh, like um, I'm trying to think, like Distro Kid and CD Baby and things like that, you want to make sure it's at a certain it's at a certain size, and then it has certain logos and certain things on it, so where they won't reject it once you put it on one of these sites to you know upload your music to a higher end platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. And so how do you get payment? Do you get payment up front, like afterwards? Yeah. Is the contracts involved? So w when it comes down to payment, that's really, every person is different when it comes down to the whole payment thing. See, me personally, when I first started, I was only taking cash. You know what I'm saying? When I first was getting paid off projects, I was taking cash. I was meeting up with people and picking up money. I personally wouldn't recommend that for people. If you live in the hood or you be around like some sketchy areas, don't meet up with people and pick up money because it's uh it may not even be that person that you should be worried about. It could be a person at the place. It could be a person watching you, watching you pick up these bags and you could be, uh, you know, possibly putting yourself in danger. But I would say, you know, once you get past that point of actually uh, picking up cash from people, I would say um, start up some payment accounts, start up, you know, um, a cash app, PayPal, Venmo. Uh, you know, those type of uh, uh, payment platforms, you know, uh, get everything on point, make sure everything is organized, you know, start you a, a, a payment website. You could have your website where through your website, you get paid directly through one of these payment platforms and do it like that. Because I feel like that's a more professional way 
to get paid, uh, you know, from your projects. And I would say when you get paid from your projects, depending on the level of the person or the amount of money that you're receiving, you can make the decision to get paid uh, a certain amount up front. But I wouldn't recommend a person to get paid a certain amount uh, or to, you know, split payments or whatever if it's for a small amount. Because I always tell people, like, what's the point of me splitting payments for forty dollars? Like twenty dollars and twenty dollars? Like that's such a small amount. We're not playing them games. Right. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, that that's basically how you work the whole payment system. Um, but when it comes down to these high, high end payments, when it comes down to thousands, that is a whole process of wiring. And uh we're not really going to get too deep into that, but I'm just letting people know because it's going to take a very long time before people actually get to that level. But once you actually get to that level where you're getting these, you know, higher end clients that's paying you thousands of dollars, it's a whole different process of wiring. And you would definitely have to work that through the client. That's not something you have to work through the websites or hand in hand because it'd be too dangerous. Yeah, I know. Um, I know when I was starting out, yes, yeah, this the cash apps and all that is cool. But then once you start getting corporate clients, bigger people. Yeah. Um, they not paying you. They not paying you. No, they not paying you cash. Yep. They not it's too cash dangerous. after you. Um, you, you, you may, you may get lucky and some of them may do a credit card transaction, but majority of the time is you're going to have to send them that, that W9, mm-hmm. send them that, that, that invoice. Yep. And then they're going to mail you a check. Yep. And sometimes people, it's a whole different process. Yeah, it's a whole it's a whole different process when you're going out the bigger bag. And so I feel like that's the reason why you have to do you have to do good business and you have to you have to be a good steward uh, of your money because some people, you know, they make money. I remember back when I first, 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 first started making money, you know, it's 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 gone. But as you grow, you realize you when you make money, you got to hold on to it because you don't know when your next client going to come through. Yep. You know what I'm saying, um, and then with the bigger clients, you could you could be sitting on ten thousand, but you waiting on ten twenty thousand dollars worth of checks to come through. What you gonna do if you don't have no money? Yeah, and that was my issue with videography. I kept when I was doing videography, I kept doing a project. You know, I do a project, get like five five six hundred whatever, and then I kept going through these long droughts of not getting no money like that, and I feel like graphic design was just way better because it was smaller amounts but it was way more consistent i wasn't going through too many of these droughts of sitting down waiting to try to see who's gonna mess with me next in order for things to work out and uh i'm not down in videography but videography started dying like you know videography used to be something that people used to watch and they used to really love like you know what i'm saying like to see somebody from your local neighborhood with a music video was exciting it's like yo that's that nigga from up the street he got a music video now like it was so dope, but then it's like it became so easy. Like it's so much people doing music videos now is just tiring to see. Like I feel like the only time we really like to see music videos is when it's like a high end, high budget music video and it's on a high end platform. It's like nowadays you'll just do a music video and you'll it's like you'll just be in the archives of YouTube. Yeah. Crazy. I stop. Um, I I enjoy doing I enjoy doing um, music videos, but um, you know, on a local level, a lot of artists can't really um, afford. Mm-hmm. They can't really afford the look that they looking for. They may want to mm-hmm. look like I want that young Dolph video. Well, you, you don't have rest that. Rest in peace. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace. You don't have that. You don't have that young Dolph money to to, to get that video. So, you know. Um, so I stopped focusing on doing music videos as as much. I started turning down stuff, and what I and what I started doing was I started learning the business side mm-hmm. of things. Like I started focusing on my education. Like mm-hmm. once I quit, once I quit my job, that allowed me to focus. That allowed me to focus more. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and especially on that education piece. And I feel like as black people. Uh, we 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 miss that piece when when we start out like we just want to hustle hustle hustle, but then we you know we don't miss like hey it's certain to get to that next level it's certain certificates it's certain things that you have to have in place to just mm-hmm. move up. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, um, man, it, it's so crazy because uh, like that makes me think about myself as like a like you know like a local rapper. Because when I was a local rapper, that was like something I used to struggle with because, um, you know, I would have money and I'd be like, man, can I, should I really 
invest this into myself because I don't know if this is really going to work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, I always just used to spend it all and just be like, man, you know, I'm just going to see what this does. And based off the results, you know, I can kind of go from there. That's something I always try to recommend for people is, man, you know, don't kill yourself, you know, giving up all your money, ending up homeless because you're trying to chase this career that ain't really moving. I would, uh, you know, one thing I always try to tell people is, you know, go ahead and work your job, do whatever you got to do to get your money and then invest into it and see where it goes. Like, you know what I'm saying? But if you invest in all this money, you're doing it for all of these years and then nothing is coming out of it. Like you spending $10,000 to get 200 views. Like I would say, start looking into other things. You know, I'm not telling you to completely run away from the rap game, but I'm saying start exploring other things around that. You know, don't keep putting yourself in position to keep taking these losses. Because, I mean, the losses is cool at first because it's like they're good for the build up for something greater. But also, I don't want people to do this at the detriment of themselves. I, I think the pro I think the problem is and, 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 and now we just speaking on, on, on the local level is a lot of these people, they just a lot of these rappers. They just, especially the ones that want to call themselves like they had their own independent label. They don't have their stuff together. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You don't have an LLC. You don't have a real record label. You know what I'm saying? Or you claim you have a real record label, but you're not signed to yourself. You don't have none mm -hmm. of your stuff copywritten. You don't know how to do distribution. None of that. And see what I'm saying? And so then you, you do a song, you pay Jay Damage, do a music video, mm -hmm. and then it don't get a million views, and then you get discouraged. Well, just because you didn't, you didn't do, you didn't do good business, you didn't set things up right. in the right manner. And um, you know, Benzo Harris, he, you know, from from Grad and Tammy, he kind of talked mm -hmm. talked on that um, on one of the podcasts. He touched on that a little bit about man, you know, you gotta do good, you know, do good business, and it's real yep. simple to start an LLC. You know what I'm saying? Ninety seven dollars to start an LLC. You know what I'm saying? in the state of Indiana. I right. don't know about the rest of the world. State but, of Indiana is ninety seven dollars some change. But, but but then again, you know, you have to understand that a lot of dudes from the hood they don't know business. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it, and that's the main reason why I kinda have a heart for people that come from the hood that come to me and I try to give them, you know, little pieces of advice that I can because I know that these individuals did not grow up grow up around anybody with business. A lot of times they don't have parents to tell them to invest into their self, to buy these certain things or even to chase their dreams. You know, um, and I was talking to my brother about this recently. It's like growing up, like hustling was normal. Like selling drugs is normal. Some people, drugs is normal within their family. Like some people don't know anything about entrepreneurship. So like, because you have to think about the school system and everything. Nobody is really being taught to become an entrepreneur. So a lot of times when people see people like me or people like you that are doing these independent videographer, graphic designer, or anything of that nature, it's like speaking another language to them because they've never seen anything like that. And then also like we live as at, within our culture, doing different things is like is like weak to people or it's like lame. Like, yo, like uh, I remember when I used to live in Chicago, I remember uh, they used to it was this videographer in Chicago. They used to clown this dude. Like, man, yo, uh, video, man. Man, we ain't fucking with this video, man. Like, you know, it's, it, like the stuff that we doing wasn't really respected at first. It wasn't really until, like, you know, videographers like AZ and, you know, a lot of these dudes, like, they really broke the barrier and made this a respected thing. At first, this stuff was nothing. When I was a rapper, I knew nothing about videography, graphic design, none of that. Like, when I ran into a, a graphic designer for the first time, I thought he was lying. <laughs> Like for real, I didn't even not, I didn't believe in that type of stuff. Right. So the fact that you know that's the main reason why I try to just have a heart for those type of people because they don't know. Right. That's why we have to tell them. Right. You know, um, but not you know not knowing though, at some point it's just not it's just not an excuse, especially in in the day and age that we live in. I feel like nowadays, see, yeah. see, I'm I'm talking about not knowing. Damn near as a past tense thing, because nowadays, I mean, we have access to the Internet. See, when I first started in 08, 09, like the Internet wasn't a big thing. There was no Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like there was no like, I would say, all these platforms to easily get all this education. I even remember when I first went to YouTube to get information to even start, you know, first doing a mixtape cover. Even some of the YouTubers that I used to get uh, tutorials from, they're not even on YouTube no more. <laughs> For real. Like, it's crazy. So like. Like getting information is so easily and accessible. Now, I feel like if you don't do it nowadays, I'm like, bro, you just lazy or something. But like 
back then, like there wasn't always information out there. People didn't know. That's why a lot of people within our age range wasn't trying to do stuff like that. Right. Well, you know, now we got the we got a lot of it's a lot of resources and different tools and different things that's available. Um, it's a lot of organizations and so forth. It's just a lot of resources that's available to help people become better at whatever it is that they, you know, trying to do. And I think that it's important mm-hmm. that we try to take um, advantage of that stuff so that we can become, you know, better entrepreneurs and, and put our families in a, um, a better position. It's only so far that, you know, mm-hmm. your knowledge that you got is, is going to take you. At some point, you're going to have to read different books. You're going to have mm-hmm. to get with a mentor. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to do something different. You're going to have to stop hanging around some of the people you know what I'm saying? That you hanging around. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because I try to tell people, like, when I first started graphic design, it was a very hard thing to do. You had to buy everything. You had to buy Photoshop. You had to buy all this stuff. Like, nowadays, if you want to be a graphic designer right now, like, you literally have no excuse. You could literally be a graphic designer on your phone, on a tablet. Like, they have apps where you can do graphic design now. There was no apps when I first started this. Like, I feel like it is so easy to become it now. And I feel like if, you, if you're if not getting it now, then you don't really want it like that. I tell people all the time, if you really want it, if you really want to be something, you really, like, really, really want to be something, No, nothing can stop you. Nothing. I'm talking about, like, you could literally go online and learn how to do this stuff. And don't be scared and reach out to people. Reach out to people. Try to get you some customers. You know, you may have to do some stuff at free, you know, for free when you first start off. But eventually, you're going to start building up that base. Once you start building up that base, then you can go ahead and start making your money. But one thing you got to do, and uh, I hope that everybody is really paying attention, is put your pride to the side. Because that pride is stopping a lot of us from getting to where we need to be. A lot of people is too cool in order to get things done. A lot of y'all is too cool. You're too gangster. You're too street to get anything done. And then... 20 years from now, you're going to be sitting there like, damn, I should have said something. But you can stop all that right now by putting your pride to the side, reaching out to those people and asking questions. Yo, how do I get this done? Where do I need to go to find out what I need to do to get this done? And you can figure it out. I'm telling you, I I didn't have no big homies. I didn't have nobody on the sideline and be like, yo, Jay, you need to do this and this and that. I took out my time. I stopped partying, stopped, stopped drinking, smoking, everything, and I dedicated my life into learning what I love to do. And that's how I got here. I'm not saying I'm rich. I'm not saying I'm poor either. I'm just saying I'm comfortable right now from taking out the time and figuring this out. Well, um, yeah, that's yeah, that's important that, that you take the time out to, to, um, to figure out what it is that, that you want to do. A lot of times we get frustrated and, and you know what I'm saying? And we and we give up. And, and they say sometimes when you give up, you right at the brink of your breakthrough or right at the brink of whatever you is trying to make pop off happen. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So how do how does Jake Damage stay focused? How does Jake Damage stay motivated? And yeah, how does Jake Damage stay motivated and focused towards his goals and his the, dreams? The, the way I stay motivated is I, I always try to do things to keep myself inspired. Like, you know what I'm saying? I always research. Always research. I always like to look up the things that I do. See, I, I, don't, I don't know if other people do that. You know, other people might have a different way of keeping themselves motivated. But I always look up what I'm doing. Like, I love graphic design. That's something that I just wake up and enjoy doing. I would do it for free, like I said. But what I like to do is sometimes I just like to explore different things within art. And I try to test it myself. I try to test and see if I'll be good at it. So um, what I do is sometimes I'll look at 3D projects. I'll try to see, okay, uh, I don't know how to do this 3D project. I'll look at certain, uh, you know, certain, uh, I would say watercolor projects, certain cartoon projects. And I always just try to like challenge myself and see if I like it, see if I, I can figure out how to do it. And once I figure out that I like it and I figure out how to do it, then I'll try to figure out how can I add that to what I'm doing? How can I add that to what I'm doing? And then I fully learn how to do it before I actually try to sell it to somebody. And I feel like that's where a lot of people miss the mark. They don't fully learn things before they try to sell it to people. I always try to say fully learn it. Make sure you know what you're talking about. So if somebody walks up to you and questions you about it, you're not looking stupid. Fully learn it and then start selling it to people. 
But yeah, like that's the way I keep myself motivated. I just always research and I always like look at the things. You have to stay updated within the realm of whatever you're doing. Like if you shoot music videos, you want to stay on point because there's going to be new effects coming out. There's going to be like, you know, new stabilizers and all different type of things that's going to be coming out. You want to stay researched and stay up to date with whatever you're doing. That will keep you motivated and that will keep you paid. Man, I, I, I want to talk about doing good business as mm -hmm. black people. <laughs> mm. I want to talk about doing good business as black people. Um, I feel like us as black people, sometimes we don't take another entrepreneur serious. Like mm -hmm. the way that I get approached sometimes by some people, I say to myself, you know that you wouldn't go approach a Target, you know, or a Starbucks or a Microsoft, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like you can't DM <laughs> Microsoft and be like, I, I, I don't want to go deep into that because then that's like a whole root of, you know, breaking down self hate. But like, um, what I think it is, is, uh, I kind of feel like we kind of just now getting into the mode of trusting each other when it comes down to business, because we knew for years that we, we weren't in these type of fields. So it's like when we approach each other with these type of fields, like, yo, I know how to do this. It's like we've seen other cultures know how to do it. We've seen other cultures be, quote unquote, more professional than us, that we trust them a little bit more than we trust ourselves. So, for example, um, for example, like I know graphic designers right now who are literally getting paid ten thousand dollars for a logo. And I'm not talking about like these high end logos that I be doing or these cartoon logos or nothing. I'm talking about logos like simple shapes. I've seen a dude get paid 10K for a square. A square, Corey. A square. A square. A like, square. No words, nothing. Just stuff. No, nothing. A square with a registered trademark next to it. And one thing I, fi I, I figured out is like, like a lot of times with us black people, it's like we'll see these other companies, these quote unquote white collar companies or white companies, we see them and we just assume that they're more professional or that um, it's weird because it's like we need like this white validation before we actually like get to the level that we need to be. It's like we can go ahead and know everything we know how to do. We could be selling, uh, you know, all type of different things. But it's like it's weird because it's like until we get this white validation, we're not at the level that we need to be when some of us are already good enough. You already good enough to be selling at Gucci prices. But the only reason why you don't sell at Gucci prices is because you feel like you don't have the presentation that they have. It's crazy because um, it took me years to figure that out. Like, you know, because, uh, for, you know, I was frustrated for like three years because I kept seeing all these graphic designers making all this money, but they wasn't even doing half of the work I was doing. And uh, I figured out like, wow, it's like people trust people don't trust when they see that it's black people sometimes it's weird it's like when people see, feel like it's black people it's like they automatically try to approach you with trying to get a deal yo i'm buying three designs for you so let me uh, uh can you drop down a price for that whatever whatever it's weird like it's like i, I don't want to get too deep into it because i don't want to be speaking down on it as if i'm speaking down about my people but i look at it like a cultural thing it's like something that we just been dealing with for a long time within ourselves you know that you know, even goes back to slavery, you know, the reason why, like, we kind of look at each other and we're always kind of iffy with each other when it comes down to business, especially when you're coming from the hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I feel you. Yeah, we definitely, um, we just, we, I just feel like we just gotta, you know, we just gotta do better when it just comes to just just doing business and just reaching out to people. But, just, but, but let me say this though. I feel like as long as there's more people like me, like black graphic designers that are helping entrepreneurs bring up this professional presentation when it comes down to doing business. I feel like the more of me is that there are helping people do that. I feel like that's going to help us build our trust, you know, to be paying each other, you know, the high end amounts. It's only because us as black people, we're the biggest consumers. And just for the simple fact that we're the biggest consumers, we can be paying each other this stuff. We can be making each other rich. But it's just that we haven't got to the point where we fully trust each other yet. Yeah, I, um, I, I, me personally, I just try to do good business as 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 
as best as I as best as I can. I try to mm-hmm. do I try to do everybody right. Do I try honest to, business. Yeah, do honest. I try to do honest business. Treat everybody right. Go above um, and, and beyond uh, because I know how important you know your name is, a, a, especially in business. But mm-hmm. I also learned too that you know you can't you can't please everybody neither. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's why it's important that you you have your ideal client because if you know who you want to work with, um, then it just make your life much easier. And sometimes you need to charge two thousand, three thousand dollars because you the headaches from a person that's paying you five hundred dollars it's 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 not worth it. The person that's paying you, if they paying you three thousand dollars, they not finna um they not finna give you the same type of they not gonna give you no headache. It's like I'm in I'm in this class right now and I pay you know money to be in this class and it's like and my coach was saying you know he paid his coach you know fifty thousand dollars you know what I'm saying to coach him for X amount of time and he's like he's requiring certain things you know what I'm saying and he's like you gonna do it for that investment right. but it's like. Per, but let's say if he was charging fifty dollars, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't take it as serious. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you need to charge a high dollar amount to demand more seriousness within the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You uh, you in the stocks? Yep. All right. So uh, so um. Okay, so I know with me when COVID, when COVID happened, COVID happened to everybody. It just had me happen to everybody, and so stuff, you know, it stopped, you know. Mm-hmm. And so when COVID happened, they gave me a, a some time to like really sit down and dive into the stock market. Mm-hmm. And so while other people were scratching their head, you know, I was thriving in the stock market sector. Okay. So, you know, so like, what's what what's your thoughts? You know, so essentially. That was my other stream of my my other stream of income because it's only four ways to make money in this world. You know what I'm saying? They could be broken down in subcategory, but it's only four ways: that's working a job, mm-hmm. that's owning the business, that's stocks, and that's real estate. Well, when it comes down to stocks, I kind of feel like stocks are becoming like this goofy thing right now because I kind of feel like a lot of people are jumping into stocks without any knowledge of what it is. They'll run into a Robinhood app. Or, uh, or you know, um, you know, one of these other apps like Coinbase or something. They basically just throw a whole bunch of money in there and just expect magic to happen. But uh, when I first started stocks, I first started stocks years and years ago. And really, the way that I got into it was dividend stocks. So basically, what I would do is I would basically invest into things that I feel like uh, people use on an every day. I'm not gonna say with specific ones, but I would say think of things that you use on an every day that you know that people are always going to need. Well, try to and also when you research stocks, try to find stocks where it's guaranteed dividends within these stocks. See, when it's guaranteed dividends within these certain type of stocks, once you invested into these, no matter where, whether it's going up or down, you always guaranteed those dividends within you know certain time frames of the year. So yeah, always tell people if you are getting into stocks, it's two different ways you want to look at it. You want to look at it from the perspective of I'm getting into this to invest into certain things where I can. Uh, uh, put a bunch of money into this certain sector and then uh, have a the patience to get this big bag out of it or I'm going to be investing into these everyday things where I know I can get dividends out of these certain things and then be make uh, getting those dividend stocks and also making money on the long end. Because really the way that you make money from stocks that a lot of people don't know is all a long game. Like, you know what I'm saying? You got to be uh, investing into the future. You want to make sure that you investing into things where you know you're going to be getting something out of it at some point in time. That's the main reason why a lot of people are jumping into crypto is because they know that eventually crypto is going to become normalized. It's going to become normalized. It may it may even be a, a, a normal currency that people are using every day to buy things, you know, eventually. So I would say when it comes down to crypto, go ahead and invest a certain amount that you feel comfortable putting in there, but don't go broke trying to get stocks when you know nothing about it right because there's way too many stock experts on facebook i'm like you can tell that these people have never had stocks before right yeah you don't uh you don't want to not tell anybody just go get robin hood and just randomly just buy a stock you know what i'm saying yeah do your research research do your research and you know make sure that before you even start putting any money into anything just try to find out ways that you can 
actually make money or uh you know just play the long game like like but i would say before you do anything don't even listen to me do your research before you do anything don't trust no random youtuber or none of that do your own research that is the way that you're gonna do good within these you know climates of of you know stocks going up and down because i've seen a lot of people jump on the uh what was that the dodge coin i've seen a lot of people lose out on a dodge coin wave well a lot of people lost out on it well, I I made money in Dodge Coins because you probably hit it early. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, see, see, every uh, everybody was banking when when the owner of a, a Tesla went on the show to mm -hmm. mention Dodge Coin, but I had a feeling that he wasn't going to do it. You see what I'm saying? So I made my money, and when I and then I pulled out literally like before he went on the show, because literally once he went on the show. It went down. Start going down. It started going down. Yep. So I so I made long all that hype around it, all that hype around it. That's you was making money, especially if you got in low. So I got in a decent price point, and when the hype was going, I made money, and then I sold before he went on the show. Mm. You know so you know, it's you 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 have to you have to be on it. You know yep, you got to be on it. You got to do your research. You got to be watching. Uh, you got to be watching these apps too. These stock apps. A lot of time, I can't remember what you call those, but you got to be watching these finance apps and seeing what's going up and what's going down. Cause I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of people lose on that dodge going, man. Yeah. <laughs> you, um, yeah. You, I mean, you can lose, you can lose out in general from not just paying attention. <laughs> yep. Just not paying attention. Yeah, you gotta be one of those type of people. If you're going to get into stocks, make sure you fully getting into it. Because like I said, I, I don't like, I've been having stocks. I don't fully get into it. I invest into everyday things that I know is going to have, cause I'm a dividend. I'm a dividend guy. I don't get into all the extra stuff. But when yeah. I when I first got into stocks, I started off real easy. I started off with Acorn. I started off with Acorn mm -hmm. and and Acorn. Like every time you go to the store and make a purchase, they just they yeah just they, they take the up. change. Yeah, they yeah. take the chain. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that, and I was like, man, I want to go a little farther. And so I went from from Acorn. To stash, I did stash for a while, and that's mm -hmm. you know based on five dollars, and that's the ETF situation. Mm -hmm. So you know what I'm saying. So all your if you buy technology, it may be, you know, I can't think of nothing to technology, but let's say social media. You mm -hmm. go Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, all of those is gonna be in, in one situation. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So I started off with that. Then after that, then I was like, I want to start actually buying a whole share of a stock like I don't want fractional shares anymore. I want mm -hmm. to buy a whole share. So then yeah. I jumped into Robinhood. Well at first cuz at first Robinhood wasn't doing fractional shares. That's new. They Robinhood I think just started doing fractional shares recently. Like at first you had to buy the whole share. Yeah. But that was the reason for me ruling what Robinhood so I could just go ahead and and um and buy the whole share and then from there it just grew and grew to other different platforms mm -hmm. cuz then you started needing other different um tools. But the whole purpose of me was pretty much bringing up the stock situation was just showing like the importance of not just just banking off just being a a graphic designer or a videographer just mm -hmm. having one stream of income it's important that we have multiple streams yes of income. yes uh people need to understand that the way to really have money money you're gonna have to have multiple streams of income that's why you know, if you see me, I don't just do one thing. I just, I do graphic design, and within graphic design, I do other types of graphic design, whether that be cartoon, whether that be mixtape covers. I'm doing motion graphics. I'm doing uh, 3D designs. I'm doing a little bit of everything, like, you know, within graphic design. So there's multiple avenues I can make within that one stream. And then as far as videography, like, people know that I shoot battle rap, which I've literally been global with that. I've been doing battle raps, I've do music videos, I've shot weddings, I've shot um, promos, I've shot commercials. I literally make sure that everything has different avenues within it so I can keep making money from so many different things. That's really the thing about hustling. If you are really a hustler and you have a hustler's mentality, you have to understand not only, you know, you know, you're going to start off, you know, selling, you know, whatever thing it is. But eventually you got to upgrade and start selling other things. That's the only way that you really go get rich or get to the point where you're comfortable is when you start, you know, having these multiple avenues. I'm telling you, like, even when I was a kid, I, I, I can remember I had a family member and I remember he told me because uh, when I was a kid, you know, uh, growing up in the hood, everybody was selling drugs. Right. I never forget. My cousin told me if you're going to sell drugs. Either go all the way 
or don't do it at all. And that's the way I look at everything. If you're going to be a videographer, you're going to be uh, uh, anything, maintenance man, worker, make sure whatever you're doing, go all the way in. Go hard to the fullest and invest into yourself and believe in yourself. That is the way that you're going to get to this next level. Can't get to the ne next level doing the same thing and uh, getting comfortable with what you're doing and just expecting to get bigger. Superman is never going to come save you. You have to work hard and get to that next level. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that shit was good. He said Superman is not going to come save you. Yeah, I, I remember when, uh, this is like 2013, I remember uh, I kept seeing this commercial where it was like uh, people are waiting for Superman to save them. And I was like, that's crazy because like if you think in life, people are always waiting for like the savior to come make them rich. Right. Like real talk, it's like people like is like waiting for like this fucking savior to come make them rich or basically give them money. Like it's so crazy the mentality some people have, and I feel like our culture we it's weird because our culture we it's like we only have like these two avenues like to be a celebrity or to be a goddamn uh, athlete, <laughs> like for real. And it's like within these, it's like we keep following these like lottery type of uh, uh, lifestyles. It's like these lifestyles that only a very small percentage of society makes it in when it's so many different avenues. See, one thing, the camera's rolling, right? One thing that we have to understand as black people is there's like people are rich and flexing from so many different things. Like, like, like people don't understand, like, uh, like people think that you can only be rich and flexing if you're a rapper. Like, because rappers are the ones that's on display the most. Rappers, you'll see them with the jewelry and the nice cars or whatever. But they're not thinking about the person who shot that music video. They're not thinking about the person who made, who made these Marvel movies. They're not thinking of the person that's putting together these ideas. They're not thinking of the person that made this equipment up in here. Those are the people that's really rich and flexing. And you can be those people if you get out of that small mindset of, of constantly trying to take these lottery opportunities. Because these lottery opportunities, we being fooled into thinking that those are the higher, the highest levels that we can be at when they're not. The rapper is literally just an employee up in a label company. But think about the person who owns the label. That is the person that's really rich. You know, it's not the it's not the rapper. That, I mean, because the rapper is rich. Don't get it twisted. The rapper is rich. They get the women and everything. They get all of the. Uh, uh, what do they call that vanity they get all of like the the, the, glitz and the, the glitz and glamour but the people that's actually really rich is the people that's organizing it the person in the nfl is just the person that has the couple millions and the person that's running things you know the the, the nfl player but the person that really has the money is the nfl owner the person that walks in the room and the nfl players get quiet for that's the real money the, the key, the key is, um, and um, it's in the ownership. I learned that real early off, and, and, and from from, um, from from my father. But just in terms of hip hop, you know, Master P. You know what I'm saying? Real preach, preaches nothing but ownership. So everything that I try to do, I try to be the owner. I try to be, you know, mm -hmm. I try to be the boss. People look at me crazy, like you got all these different businesses, but you know. It's about being the owner, controlling your own situation. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I want to be the check writer. I'm not, you know, you know. it used to be cool at first. People say you want to get signed to a label, but I thought about it like you said. It's like at the end of the day, the artist is just, a, it's just an employee. The, the real person is the one who signed that artist yes. and put up that money. Because without them, what would you be? Like they yes. believed in you, put up the money. And then put you out down the road and you yes. become who you are. That's why I feel like Dame Dash interview on Breakfast Club was so important because he was basically trying to break down to people that no matter what it is, until you have ownership, you're always going to have a daddy. You're never going to be in that position in order to do exactly what you want to do and to make your own moves and control your situation. Like, you know, I'm telling you, man, like there's so many great things that we can be doing, but we keep trying to get these lottery situations. Like I'm talking about like, um, I remember when I was in college, I used to always like hear people like basically fighting to get these jobs. But I used to always be thinking to myself like, but man, if we just was owning these companies, I mean, don't get it twisted. You know, 
the, we need workers too. <laughs> like I'm not telling everybody to try to be the boss, but I'm saying like, just think about if we had a whole mindset growing up or even, you know, learning within the school systems, if we were all being taught to be entrepreneurs within these different areas, just think about how people would respect our culture more. You know what I'm saying? Like people, I feel like a lot of times people don't respect our culture because they feel like we're going into entrepreneurship blindly and we don't have a lot of these sweat years of learning a lot of these fields. But that's why I feel like we need to start learning these fields early. We need to start exploring. I didn't start being good at my situation until I started exploring different things. And that's why I try to encourage people. Start learning different things. Don't put yourself in a box and think that you can only get to these certain part, these certain points in life because you're black. Because I'm telling you, it's so many other great things that you can learn and you can really break barriers. I um, I remember uh, in my early in my early years, you, and I and I think I remember I was telling you the story mm -hmm. um, that I was being subcontracted out through this um, through this wedding company. And, you know, I was just doing it like supplement income because I had just quit my job or whatnot. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had really wanted to, I had done like one wedding on my own, but I had wanted more. You know what I'm saying? I had wanted more experience. So they brought me on the board and I started learning the, 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 the game, essentially, uh, the wedding videography game, how to do it or whatnot. And, you know what I'm saying? But solely just from shooting, from a shooting perspective, not like how to run like the back end. Mm -hmm. And I never really cared, you know what I'm saying? I liked it the wedding essentially because of the money, you know what I'm saying? They pay more money than music videos. Artists would, you know, you know, you make two, three, four, five hundred from a music video, depending on what they're looking for. But a wedding, that's a thousand dollars easy, you know what easy, I'm saying? Yeah. On on the subcontract level. So I was like, cool. And one day I was talking to the manager, the supervisor, I don't know what he is, my contact person. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, man, I'm sorry I couldn't get back with you as quick. He was like, man, the day we had this, he said this weekend we had 80 weddings or 50 weddings. And when he said that, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a hustler. You can't tell me nothing like that. I don't think my wheel's not going to get to spinning. Mm -hmm. I instantly took out the calculator. I got to doing the math. I was like, boy... This, so you telling me that's about a hundred thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars in one weekend? Then I got to breaking down all the pieces. Like, oh, okay, so you need this person, that person. Then it's just the editor. Then I was like, so the only piece is this. Then after you pay these people, then you probably left about with this much. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, so that's subconscious. And, <laughs> that's dead. I'm and, starting. And, and what, you, what you have to pay attention to is, he's not shooting no music videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, not not music videos. Excuse me. He's not shooting no weddings. Mm -hmm. He's not actually out there in the field. He's nothing but the boss and the organizer. Exactly. That's why I be trying to tell people like, a lot of times the boss ain't doing nothing. That's what that like people don't understand. Like, once you put yourself into to these position, you could really get your own independence. Being that boss, but you know, being a boss is a lot of work. But I'm telling you, like, you could be in that position and you could be flexing and you could basically just be middleman in a lot of these projects. Right. I, I met a dude that was selling um uh, mobile homes. I'm talking about for a long time. I thought he was out there actually selling the mobile homes. He was nothing but just a middleman, and he was rich. So it's crazy. Like it's so crazy how these fields that we can get into, but we just never think to do it. Man, we we just gotta believe in ourselves, and we just gotta pay. We just gotta pay attention, and then we just gotta be willing to get trained. One thing that I was not afraid early on was to work with somebody for free you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. i remember hitting up jimmy ball like, hey bro let me you know come and be on set just learn or whatever ryan blasky that's his name right? blasky yeah I'll hit up, you. hitting up ryan blasky you know hey bro let me come out get your coffee like i'm just trying to be on sets i remember hitting because i want it to learn because mm -hmm. i had the passion i had the hunger i had the desire to be in that field but, but let me and stop you expertise. there though but let me stop you there though because what made you do that, though, what made you actually get to the point of doing that was putting your pride to the side. See, what it is, is a lot of dudes that come from these, you know, poverty environments or whatever, they have this pride of living this certain type of lifestyle of always trying to be cool or be hard that they don't put their pride to the side and ask questions or put themselves in position to do the things like that. And I think that's something that's a detriment to our culture that's hurting us is that people won't put their pride to the side and say, you know what, let me go ahead and go do a couple free projects. 
Let me do what I have to do in order to get my name out there, to get people to trust me, to get myself into this position. Mm -hmm. People don't want to do that. And I feel like that's what's hurting people. And anybody that's watching this, I would encourage you, put your pride to the side, go learn what you need to do and do what you have to do to get yourself into that position. I'm not telling you to, you know, hurt your integrity by going out and basically giving yourself away and doing some crazy stuff. But I'm just saying, don't, don't be so prideful that you miss your opportunity for a chance of a lifetime for you to be in the field that you need to be in. Yeah, definitely gotta put that gotta put that pride to the side um, mm -hmm. to to um, to get that knowledge. Um, pride, you know what what the Bible say? Pride comes, but pride comes before a fall. I believe. Don't don't beat me up <laughs> to the Bible it. scholars out there. But I ain't read in some time, so yeah, I don't even want to say it either. <laughs> But yeah, man, we have to we have to do those things. We have to link up with people that that just that just know more. Like we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in mm -hmm. order to get to what we're trying to get to. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I want I want a yacht, you know, and mansions and you know all of that financial, all of that, all of that. But in order to but on the other side of that. Is right like in order for me to get there, I have to be uncomfortable. Yep. You know, I have to lose sleep. Mm -hmm. I gotta cut off certain people. Yep. I can't eat what I want to eat. Yep. I can't go where I want to go. All you the have time. to make those sacrifices. You gotta make, you gotta sacrifices. make those sacrifices in order to get to that position. You know, uh, one thing that uh, a, a guy on Facebook always says, named Nino Brown, he was like, the difference between rich and poor is information. You know, literally all you need is the information. It's just sometimes the only reason why you can't get that information is because your pride is keeping you from asking. Your pride is keeping you from going into these rooms and putting yourself in position to get around it. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, I mean, they used to say uh, the way to keep a black person from learning is putting it in a book. Don't be scared to read a book. Don't be scared to read a book. Don't be scared to research and sit down and read. <laughs> read. <laughs> I'm a I'm a big advocate I'm a big advocate of reading. I was telling my wife the other day at some point, you know, um, you know, at first I I was like, hey, I got my college education, I graduated, ooh, I'm cool, but it's but yo, you have to you have in order to be successful, in order to to go, you trying you have to constantly learn, 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 learn. Mm -hmm. I was watching this this documentary on Netflix and it was on um it was on Bill Gates and I ain't gonna lie I ain't watched the whole I ain't watched the whole thing mm -hmm. but um it was certain aspects of his life that they highlighted like they 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 like Bill Gates like I don't know if it's like once a year at some point in his life every, like every year he goes away to this cabin with a whole bunch of books and all he do is just sit down and just, just read. read. And make, I'm not surprised. And make and make time for think like we have as people like as people or aren't you, just as people, we need to start especially if you want to be successful. You have to make time to read books and you have to make time to be a thinker. Like stop mm -hmm. giving up so quickly. The only difference between you and the person that you admire is that they just didn't give up. They didn't just mm -hmm. stop thinking. And, and and then something that happened within our culture is. At some point in time, they made everything that you're supposed to do uncool. It was weird. And uh, uh, I remember my dad was saying that. He was like, it's so crazy that everything that we need to do as people, like it's like we make not cool. Like getting good grades is not cool. <laughs> like reading, reading books, going to a library and getting that knowledge is not cool. It's like, yo, like trying to be a better you is not cool. And being the worst of the worst of yourself is like cool like do you know like of course yesterday young Dolph was killed but um the crazy thing is i seen a lot of people like joking like respect the shooters and i was like it's so crazy that the lowest form of ourself is being glorified but the highest form of ourself is being looked at as a square it's dangerous it's a dangerous mind state that we looking at everything like that because that's not going to do nothing but hurt our culture to the max that's why I always try to tell people, I'm not telling you to be a graphic designer. I'm not telling you to be a videographer. I'm not even telling you to go into any of these things that we're speaking about right now. But I'm just telling you, if you explore other things within life instead of these lottery opportunities that I keep going back to of being some rapper or some entertainer, 
then you will lose is only because those are lottery decisions and no telling what's going on behind closed doors to get them into those positions. You know? Man, they say if you get something for nothing, then you pay too much for it. Mm. They want to go get that refund back because they out here capping on the internet and we just falling for it. We just falling for it every single time. Yep. And I, I, I mean, I learned quick, man. Like, especially, you know, you know something, and you could probably relate to this. When you're a videographer, you start really realizing that rappers don't have money like that. <laughs> like, real talk, like, like I, I was peeping that, like, because I'm talking about, I've been around a lot of rappers. I've been around low-end rappers, high-end rappers, famous rappers. And, like, it's like, I always kind of notice, even rappers who have money, like, it, like they really don't be wanting to pay like that. <laughs> like, it's crazy, like, it's crazy that no matter at what level they're at, People still really don't be having money like that. So I always try to tell people, be careful what you're glorifying because your gods may not be gods. Mm. They just like you. Right. Just with a, a bunch of more money being put in front of them. Yeah. Yeah, people with money, they, they, they have a different mindset. They move a little different. I remember I had uh, this idea for this, this, um, this business venture that I wanted to do. And I was around the table with a bunch of... Um, successful people you know what i'm saying and i was telling them the idea and then they was just loving it i mean they was just eating it up and then i told them what my price point was for the product and then they said no nobody's nobody's going to buy that and i said why not they said because it costs too much people rich people with money i used to getting stuff for free yep so you so if you want it's not that you it's not that they wouldn't buy the product the service it's just that the price point is just too high because they used to just get stuff for free. And mm -hmm. that, mess, that messed me up mm -hmm. at this table. And that's when I knew that, man, that I, I needed I, to learn more. I needed to do more. I heard something from this videographer. I don't know if it's true, so don't quote me on this. And I don't want this to hopefully not offend Soldier Boy. But one time I heard uh, there was a videographer who reached out to Soldier Boy and they said that... Uh, I shouldn't be mentioning the name, but but anyways, yeah, they said he reached out to Soldier Boy and they said Soldier Boy was like, uh, you know, why would I pay you that if there's videographers who want to do videos for me for free? So it's like, why would I pay you, you know, this high amount? Like, you know, people don't understand that about celebrities. Like sometimes celebrities like feel like they shouldn't have to pay you this super amount. That's why a lot of times you have to build your name up before you actually get to the point of actually approaching these high end people. So if you're a, vi a videographer, a graphic designer, any type of person that's within media, a lot of times when you reach these high-end clients, you have to have a name established. Otherwise, they will run you into the dirt. Yeah, they will. They will. Uh, people higher up like that, especially in that celebrity world, they will use you. Mm -hmm. They will use you and take advantage of you. And you, you just the graphic designer, you the videographer. And this is real game that we giving like right now. Yeah. Like they, they will, they will use and take advantage of you. They not trying to help you. And you thinking because you hungry. Like yeah, you just want your name mm -hmm. attached to that. But to be honest with you, that's about as far as it's gonna go. They will use you. They will. They gonna use you. You know what I'm saying? And they just gonna. Go to the next one. It's just like yep. it's just like the it's just like the pimp game. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It's just like the pimp game. The pimps they get they get the women and they they know that they only have a certain amount of time to use them up before they wise up and they and they read they done with that life. It's the same thing exactly. with these entertainers and these rappers and these the select in that higher up world. Like they will use you and take advantage of you mm -hmm. if you don't have no name. Mm -hmm. it's, that's why like like Jay says the point that you build build up your name you know what I'm saying make them want to work with you exactly other than that you're not going to get paid to reach out to a designer get your, get yourself that professional presentation you know get everything on point your websites your all your social media make sure everything is branded professionally make sure you fully know what you're talking about make sure you have the knowledge of everything that you're doing and then you approach these people and basically don't go to anybody looking like you're starving <laughs> Because if you're looking like you're starving, they're going to treat you like a dog. Yeah. They can, they can, you, they, they can, when you're doing business and um, they can, people can smell desperation on you. <laughs> exactly. They, 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 they can, they, they can smell it. You know what I'm saying? People know what, what a project is worth. And then if you're talking about 200, they know you're desperate or something. And you're thinking like, hey, 
you thinking that you undercutting your clientele, but in reality, you're really just making yourself look bad, and they're going to go, th- I mean, I mean, you make your competitors, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? You really think you undercutting your competitors, but you're really making yourself look bad, and they go to your competitor, they go to somebody else, just because you simply, and it's not to say that you couldn't do the work. You can do mm-hmm. the work. You just as equally talented as them. It's just that your price was just too low. You let your situation, the way you at right now, dictate to how much, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And that and that, can, that would be a detriment Some, to you. Something I seen Boosie say one time is, um, Boosie said, if I if I walk into this label with all my chains on, they know that they can't offer me a deal for 100000 They know they can't play with me with little money if they know that I got it already. He's. I walk into. I walk into one of these labels with a million dollars worth of jewelry. They know not to offer me a million dollars because I got it already. I'm showing you. You see it on me. You know not to play with me. Like people will play with you if they don't. You're desperate. Yeah. Oh, this nigga desperate for money. Okay. Cool. Go ahead. We gonna have him. We gonna have him do all these little projects. These projects we pay dude to do. We could just have dude do that. And then as soon as we done with dude, go ahead block him afterwards. I'm telling you, this is the game that they really pull on people. And like, like, uh, oh, let me tell y'all, a graphic design game. See, this is something a lot of y'all, y'all probably never even heard of this. So a lot of new graphic designers, I'm going to put y'all on to something that celebrities do. This is a real slick game that celebrities do. And they actually use graphic designs to promote their projects. So this, this is what uh, artists do. I, I even think labels tell artists to do this, right? So basically what uh, an artist would do. They'll already like put they or a matter of fact, they'll get to the point where they're gearing up to put their album out. Right. Or their mixtape. Right. So what they'll do is they'll make a post either on Instagram, Facebook or whatever. And they'll say, hey, I need uh, a graphic designer. Well, I, uh, I'm going to start a contest to get uh, the best cover possible for my album. A lot of people don't know this, but in reality, they already have their album cover because they have a, every label has their own designer. They have their own designers, their own everything. So they already have everything set for that artist. But what they do to drive promotion to their self as a big name artist is get a whole bunch of people to make like different covers of their project in order to basically have their project everywhere without their project actually even being out yet. That's like a slick way that they basically get a bunch of designers to work on a project to basically make a fake contest. And basically... The designer that they already got, they have make the cover, the final cover, and then they say, oh, yeah, here's the winner. <laughs> wow. So Young Thug got a contest going on right now. I'm not now. saying that for Young Thug. Not, not saying. for the Young Thug. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't because I don't know his situation personally, but I'm saying this is a scam that they do. This is a scam that they do. I'm not saying Young Thug personally because I don't know this man and I don't and, and I think Young Thug may possibly be independent. So I'm not necessarily saying him. I'm just saying a lot of times when these artists go through these big name labels, this is the game that they play. And I'm telling you, you're going to be spending all them days working on that design, get, paying all that money to get them stock images and all this crazy shit. And then that nigga going to look at your design and be like, oh, yeah, you didn't win. <laughs> when in reality, they already got their winner. So be careful, ladies and gentlemen. Be careful in the game because people will get you. People will get you.